All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, we are, after last night, we opened up the phone lines. We decided, you know what? Um, one of the perspectives we don't get as much in this conversation, you see the live reports, you see the protesters, but it's not just a Ferguson, Missouri issue. This is something, obviously, we've seen played out in our region here, Staten Island, obviously, most uh, notably recently, but in so many other places. And the question is, before that gun got fired, what's in the mind of that 18-year-old young man and that officer. Now, we're never going to know from Mr. Brown, and unless he chooses to testify from Mr. Wilson, we may not know either the officer in question, but it's that kind of baggage that's brought to this situation in so many places that is really, um, I think, the national conversation we need to have. And, and to, to start that, we're going to bring you in on the phone lines, and let's start off uh, with Michael, who's calling us out of Yonkers. Michael, you're on the line. Go ahead. Yes, uh, good evening. Yes, uh, this happened about 10 years ago. I worked for a utility, and I was in the middle of a blackout uh, to restore people in light, and I made a U-turn on Central Park Avenue about 10.30 at night. An officer of color pulled me over, and I thought he was going to give me an escort to the station where I had to restore the people, but he uh, pulled me over, and he gave me a, a, one of my license and registration. I said, I'm in a little blackout. I have a person on life-sustaining equipment and I need to get to the station to restore the people in life. And he says, I'm not really interested in your story. I want your license and registration. And he took 22 minutes, and he came back and he gave me a ticket. And his other officer that was with him in front of Phil and Pepe's over there on Central Avenue pulled his gun on me. I was in a utility vehicle with my emergency lights on, and he stood on the corner, pulled his gun on me while the officer gave me a ticket. And I said, I would like to get you a badge number. He says, for what? I said, because if this person dies, I'm going to testify for the family that you pulled me over for, for making a U-turn on Central Avenue. He says, go ahead. He says, here's my badge number. Have a good night. And, that, you know, that was, you know, of course, I went to the city, uh, yeah. bought the ticket, yeah. and the judge threw it out without even hearing my story because when he heard about the utility and the blackout. Yeah, and, yeah there is a little bit of common sense that would help uh, to be involved in the situation. Thank you, Michael. Let's see what Verley has to say. In New Jersey, Verley, you're on the line. Yes. My concern is that there are so many things going on in the black community that America is not aware of. We see what's on the news, and that's just a fraction of what's happening. But I have a problem with that letter from the police officer who was in the L.A. force. He sounded like someone who thinks a badge gives him authority to be God. You're there to serve the people. You're there to be a good police officer. If someone is guilty or you suspect them, you talk to them and you tell them, I am going to arrest you. I'm going to take you to the station. But don't say you have to obey me, and if you obey me, this is not going to happen. That causes riots and that causes anger, and that's how I feel about it. Really, thank you very much for the phone call. And, and I, Dom, Dom, I think so much of this comes down to a simple word of respect, okay? And... Listen, the people I know that are on the job, nothing bothers them more than they said, listen, I may not be making a ton of money doing this. Um, I, I, I know there's stuff that I got to do that people don't want to do that I, that's part of my job and I'm expected to do this. And when other people get to run, I have to go forward into it. But you know what? The least you owe me, if I went through all this, is you give me respect if I got a badge. And, and I know that it's oversimplified, but when that doesn't happen, that's, that's the root of so many of these problems. And then there's the overreactions, and then there's the, you know, and then if you, you bring up the point that, hey, it does say protect and serve on the side of the car, you know? Um, they say, you know, walk a mile in my shoes, you'll understand what we deal with every day, you know? And I, I think that, in and of itself, is this part that's so hard to break through, you know? It's an excellent uh, theory, but I, but I don't know, Richard. Uh, I'm not saying it justifies it, anything, but I think that's a big part of this. If, if we should be respectful of police officers, I'll give you that much. But we don't owe you anything. I mean, we're paying the public is paying your salary, and I think a lot of police officers don't want to deal with that fact. Go. I mean, uh, let me just say this one thing. Imagine, God forbid, this ever happens to any of us. Imagine you roll up on the scene, right, and your son's body has been on the ground for four hours with the entire shot in the head twice and the entire community, can, and your son is laying there like a deer. And the cops are telling everybody, and you're gonna talk about respect? 
Yeah. You, you will no, no. never get no, no, respect no, no. after I, that. I, listen, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm on the same page with you. I saw a number today, Andrew, which was interesting, which was in New York, about two-thirds of the police officers in the NYPD live in the five boroughs. But if you break it down by race, more than three-quarters of uh, officers of color, I'm talking black and Latino, they live um, in the five boroughs while less than half of the white officers live there. I understand there's some mathematical problems when you talk about the cost of living in the city to make everybody that works, just use New York City as an example, to live in the community. But I don't know. Maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe there's such a gap or a distance between the people who police and the people who live there that don't see each other as neighbors. If it's such a bad job as a police officer, I know Andrew wanted to come, but if it's such a bad job, why take it? If you get no respect and nobody likes you, why take the job? It, it, to, it, it speaks to the community policing. You can police your community better if you live in that community. I think that's just universal. And if any officer thinks that people don't inherently default respect police officers, remember back to the days after 9-11. Cops would get out of their cars and they'd get rounds of applause for just getting out of their cars for being uh, first responders. So I think people inherently want to respect police officers, but if you disrespect the people you're supposed to protect and serve, how do you expect to get that back? It's a complicated conversation, and I want you to keep it going online. Go to Facebook and Twitter and sound off on this issue. And also, tomorrow night, we're going to bring this closer to home here. Um, and, in fact, uh, Dominic's got a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Ray Kelly this coming Monday to get the police perspective on this. But tomorrow, we're going to hear all sides of this as it relates to the Garner's case. It'll be a special RFL program tomorrow, Friday at 6 p.m. Thank you, guys. RFL will be right back, and believe it or not, it's been 40 years since that man resigned from office in the Watergate scandal the day that changed American politics forever. Former Connecticut governor, then Connecticut Senator Lowell Waker, he'll speak to us about serving on the Senate Watergate to get committee. Talk about that and much more after this.